For centuries, mysterious objects in the sky have fascinated humanity, sparking intrigue, debate, and controversy. In the year 2008, an incident took place that would add a significant chapter to this enigmatic narrative. In Kumburgas, a quiet coastal town located in Istanbul, Turkey, the calm of the night was disrupted as an uncanny object appeared in the sky, unlike any conventional aircraft. During his night shifts, Yalchen Yalman, a resident of Kumburgas, carefully observed the skies. In the quiet darkness, he found himself at the heart of an unfolding mystery capturing something extraordinary. Local residents had reported oddities in the sky for years. Silent, disc and oval shaped objects, often glowing with red and orange light. Yalman's camera recorded an unusual object, clear and distinct against the night sky. From local community members to international experts, the incident captivated the public, and almost overnight, Kumburgas was thrust into the center of one of the most intensely examined and debated UFO encounters in recent history. Never before seen footage of UFO sightings this year are being shown at a conference in Pontefract. Just as you say, a range of guests at the UFO conference here in Pontefract. But the highlight, I think, of the conference is the footage. The footages are so interesting and so amazing because we see, we don't just see the lights in the sky, we see in the close up the outline of the object. Did the footage taken by Yalchen Yalman genuinely capture images of extraterrestrial life? Or was it simply an unusual earthly event, exploited by a vast media campaign? As humans, our fascination with the unknown and our unending desire to uncover answers to things we don't understand fuels our interest in UFOs and extraterrestrials. But this curiosity can also leave us open to deception where the truth might be less extraordinary than it seems. The intrigue surrounding UFO sightings goes beyond simple mystery. They tap into cultural values, governmental responses, and the power of media in shaping our perceptions, reflecting the deeper societal anxieties and existential fears in a world with a growing sense of uncertainty. What came next in the Kumburgas incident would leave everyone in a state of shock triggering intense controversy and widespread speculation. But to fully understand the significance of these events, we first need to examine the complex and secretive history of UFOs by going back to a period marked by significant global change. It was the winter of 1958. The Cold War had driven the world to the brink of paranoia, but on one evening, a completely different kind of confrontation was about to unfold. CBS, one of the giant broadcasters of the age, aired an episode focusing on a mystery that had captured the imagination of millions, unidentified flying objects. At the center of this show stood Major Donald Kehoe, a respected Marine Corps naval aviator and the director of NICAP, an organization that demanded the truth about UFOs. Behind the scenes, CBS, with the U.S. Air Force's guidance, had tightly scripted the episode, and all guests were instructed to adhere strictly to the script. But as the broadcast unfolded, Kehoe began to deviate, hinting at secret information that hadn't yet been shared with the public. Just as he was about to reveal a shocking piece of information, his microphone went dead. Rumors were circulating that Kehoe intended to announce that a U.S. Congressional Committee had evidence supporting the undeniable existence of UFOs. 
we are being observed by some type of device which is ahead of us, far ahead of us, and is probably controlled by a highly advanced superior civilization. In fact, the Air Force at one time had a top secret estimate that these things were interplanetary spaceships. Following the broadcast, chaos ensued. The public cried out, alleging that a cover-up had taken place. CBS would later admit, under pressure, that they had observed specific security standards, hinting at governmental influence. Major Kehoe, first of all, let me ask you this. Most people in the United States, in spite of the fact that I say that millions do believe, I think you will agree that most people in the United States don't believe in flying saucers from outer space. They probably hold the view of columnist Bob Considine, who wrote that flying saucers are products of, for the most part, quote, pranksters, halfwits, cranks, publicity hounds, fanatics in general, and screwballs, end quote. How do you feel about Mr. Considine's charge? If they're screwballs and incompetence, why are they still on the job? This episode cast a shadow suggesting that for decades, the U.S. government had been pulling strings behind the scenes, manipulating how UFOs were portrayed in the media. It was a moment that changed everything, but the real motivations behind these actions linked to global events and secrecy would remain hidden for years. These events of the late 50s were not the first of their kind, Similar events regarding aerial phenomena and public perception had begun to emerge a decade earlier. The years following the Second World War were saturated with an air of tension and suspicion. The onset of the Cold War had drawn a clear line dividing the world into two camps. In this paranoid atmosphere, something extraordinary would take place. In 1947, Kenneth Arnold, an unassuming civilian pilot, embarked on a flight that marked a pivotal moment in modern history. Over the picturesque landscape of Mount Rainier, Arnold seemingly found himself sharing the skies with nine strange unidentified aerial phenomena. Arnold claimed these objects had an unconventional design, consisting of flat, reflective disks complemented by a triangular tail. He described their movement as being similar to saucers smoothly gliding over water and estimated that they reached speeds of around 1200 miles per hour, surpassing any known aircraft of the time. His descriptions of what he had seen that night prompted the press to popularize the terms flying saucer and flying disc. By the next morning, Arnold's tale had gripped the world, setting off a chain of similar sightings by citizens. The light was coming at me, it was extremely bright, the inside of the car lit up, I can remember that, and uh, it was a very dazzling, brilliant occurrence. It was a perfect shape, it was, it was shaped it was sort of more like a pearl with a, with a tail. It was approaching fairly fast, and then suddenly, um, gradually rather, it, it began to thin out, and it vanished. Consequently, these witnesses reported seeing objects that aligned more with the term flying saucer, instead of Arnold's detailed and more complex descriptions. They observed disks and saucers, symbols that over time would become deeply ingrained in the public consciousness. As the story was retold repeatedly, the concept of the flying saucer began to take on a life of its own, overshadowing what Arnold had actually witnessed. And as a result, the public became so engrossed in the symbol that they lost touch with the initial encounter, finding themselves in a loop of stories that strayed from the truth. Uh, it is very typical that it is a rash, because if you get one report, uh, you get a clutch of other reports following it. It feeds on itself, and the main problem there is that the term flying saucer, or to go official about it, UFO, has produced a label. Because these aerial phenomena prompted speculation about their origins, some began to wonder if they represented advanced Soviet technology, signaling potential threats. Others believed them to be potential advancements in aviation cloaked in secrecy. 
this widespread speculation from ordinary citizens to military personnel added to the era's confusion and uncertainty. The United States government wanted to ensure that these unidentified objects were not new foreign technologies. Yet, in the silent corridors of power, deceptive plans were being set in motion, aimed at understanding these mysterious aerial phenomena. But it wasn't until March of 1952, with the establishment of Project Blue Book, that the government's efforts to manage the UFO phenomenon intensified. Operating out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, Project Blue Book's objective was clear, to determine if UFOs were a threat to national security and scientifically analyze the associated data. Just months after the inception of Project Blue Book in summer of 1952, something unusual took place. Washington, D.C., a city accustomed to secrets and politics, faced something new and puzzling. In Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen at the CAA Traffic Control Center at National Airport for several hours, traveling more than 100 miles an hour. Air Force jet fighters spend several hours chasing the objects plotted on the radar scope. Over several nights, the Capitol experienced a series of bizarre events, later known as the Washington National Airport sightings. On one of these nights, an air traffic controller noticed strange objects on his radar. These weren't conventional aircraft. Their behaviors were erratic and unlike any known vessel. The intrigue grew when another radar in the city reported seeing orange balls of fire moving in ways that seemed impossible. Observers on the ground also began to report sightings of bright, fast-moving lights that stood apart from anything they had seen before. The situation escalated when jet fighters were sent to investigate. But as they neared, the mysterious objects disappeared. The media latched on to the story, with headlines broadcasting the appearance of mysterious saucers over the city. In a press conference following the sightings, Major General John A. Samford, the Air Force's Director of Intelligence, tried to calm the public. But to many, this felt like another evasion, another half-truth. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. The recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. In the shadows, another narrative was taking shape. The extremely high number of UFO reports following the Washington incident began to deeply disturb both the Air Force and the CIA. As a result, a group of elite scientists, led by physicist and CIA consultant Howard Robertson, was formed to investigate and decipher the true nature of the UFO cases that were documented by Project Blue Book. They would become known as the Robertson Panel. But the group's primary concern wasn't the UFOs themselves. Instead, their narrative appeared to cater to the interests of powerful institutions. They expressed a concern that the public interest in UFOs, the fact that people could go out and think that Venus was a UFO or a weather balloon was a UFO, could be exploited by the Soviet Union in a surprise bombing attack on the United States. Robertson and the panel quickly advised the Air Force to demystify UFOs in the eyes of the public and remove the extraordinary significance they had been attributed. They believed that the government needed a coordinated propaganda campaign, not only to scientifically address the UFO accounts, but also to actively discredit and marginalize them. This involved enlisting professionals from various disciplines, including psychiatrists and astronomers, to shape public perception. By crafting programs to cast doubt on UFO sightings, they aimed to dampen what they perceived as national hysteria regarding the UFO phenomenon. Despite the government's efforts to assuage public concern, skepticism ran rampant. The perceived secrecy surrounding the topic heightened suspicions of government cover-ups 
driving whispers of hidden alien technology despite any hard evidence of such findings. The United States government grappled with managing the public's curiosity about the unknown. What they realized was that they could employ the very tactics they feared the Soviets might use against their own population. For Yalchun Yalman, the answers didn't come easily. The scrutiny he faced after the footage went public was overwhelming. Some accused him of fabricating the video for fame, while others deemed him a hero, believing his evidence was genuine. With the sudden talk of UFOs in Kumbergaz, the Turkish government and experts began to take notice. Among these experts was Haktan Akdoğan, a well-respected name in Turkish UFO research who found himself in possession of this potential evidence. He realized he could be onto something that would change the way society looked at the sky forever. Haktan's UFO research group, together with Yalçın Yalman, would soon be thrust into a whirlwind of media activity surrounding the footage. Seeking to clarify the situation, Haktan was invited to appear on the nation's popular television program known as The Reporter. In this segment dedicated to the mystery, he defended the validity of the footage against Dr. Adnan Öktem, a scientific skeptic. Haktan challenged him to a live analysis of the footage at a research facility as the nation waited eagerly for answers. These organizations, who were highly respected for their stringent standards, took on the daunting task. Everyone expected a quick resolution, perhaps revealing the footage as a simple misinterpretation of natural phenomena or an elaborate hoax. But as days went by, the atmosphere grew more intense. News traveled fast, crossing borders and oceans. Experts from as far away as Japan, Brazil, and beyond felt compelled to weigh in. They pored over every frame, analyzed each movement, and debated every shadow. Yalçın Yalman found himself under the microscope with the media and public speculating about whether he was just lucky enough to capture the footage, or if he was a fraud. As the anticipation built, the most shocking revelation was yet to come, and it would change the narrative entirely. And for the umpteenth time in as many years, the Air Force, called before a congressional committee, said it was hiding nothing. Air Force Secretary Harold Brown. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. The hearing this morning was public for just that reason. Uh, in those cases where for lack of data or lack of a convincing hypothesis, the sighting has been kept in the unidentified category, we've been perfectly willing to say that too. In 2003, the Department of State disclosed internal records that showed the ways in which the U.S. government had utilized the UFO phenomenon in the 1950s to further its own interests, often at the expense of its own citizens. A crucial document unveiled that while the CIA was plotting a coup against Guatemala's democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz, in 1954, the Guatemalan government caught wind of their intentions. This coup was not just about politics. It was wrapped in the Cold War's anti-communism sentiment and the interests of the American corporate giant, the United Fruit Company. To discreetly shield their operations, the CIA contemplated tapping into the public's fascination with UFOs. A telegram to their station in Guatemala 
provided guidance on how to use UFO stories to divert attention from their oversteps in national sovereignty. While the CIA employed such tactics in Guatemala, other UFO sightings were simultaneously being concealed. Area 51 became a focal point of UFO legends in the 1950s, though many of its sightings turned out to be advanced military aircraft. Perceptions of UFOs which originated in the United States during the mid-20th century amidst Cold War anxieties played a pivotal role in shaping global views on these phenomena. This influence was evident more than three decades later when Belgium became a major center for UFO sightings. As the Cold War neared its end, Europe and in particular Belgium found itself in the UFO spotlight. Near Eupen, Belgium, in the winter of 1989, two local policemen reported seeing a large, triangle-shaped object in the sky. Soon, other similar sightings surfaced near Brussels. Rumors suggested that these could be U.S. aircraft tested without Belgium's consent. However, the U.S. Embassy denied any unauthorized flights. This video of the F-16's radar track of the object showed the performance of a vehicle of a totally unknown origin. The Air Force were at a complete loss to explain their findings. A press conference was called. What these pilots um, uh, detected was well outside the normal flying envelope of an airplane. And in addition, a visual observation on the ground confirmed by the police we decided to send two airplanes in the air uh, around midnight. The Belgian Society for Study of Space Phenomena spearheaded investigations into these sightings. Partnering with the Belgian government, they tried to explain the phenomenon, yet evidence remained elusive, and media sensationalism only intensified. Despite the surrounding excitement, the investigation faced internal obstacles. A significant number of critiques were directed at the investigation's lead scientists for prematurely attributing the craft's origins to extraterrestrial sources, causing many to doubt the organization's ability to remain unbiased. Critics proposed that the media's magnification of common sightings might have created a cascade effect, turning everyday events into seemingly otherworldly mysteries. With Brussels housing NATO's headquarters, Geopolitics may have also influenced these sightings and public reactions. The Belgian UFO wave, despite its extensive media coverage and varied explanations, remains officially unsolved, fueling ongoing debate and fascination. But meanwhile, in Kumbergas, the investigation into Yalchen Yalman's footage was nearing its conclusion and would soon reveal the truth. As everyone waited for the results of the analysis of Yalchen Yalman's footage, speculation ran rampant. Whispers intensified about a potential covert military response to the UFO presence. Turkey's history of classified operations further fueled this speculation. The narrative evolved from just a piece of footage to encompass geopolitics, defense strategies, and the unknown. Kumbergas wasn't an ordinary town. Situated in a NATO member country and in close proximity to many military bases, the timing and location of the sighting became even more perplexing. It seemed improbable that such an event could go unnoticed given the abundance of military equipment and expertise in the area. Amidst the discussions, debates, and scrutiny, people sought a conclusion. The town of Kumbergas, its residents, and indeed the world, awaited answers. And just when it seemed the story might fade into obscurity, a final revelation sent shockwaves through the UFO community. Nearly a week after Haktan Akdoğan had publicly challenged skeptics on national television, a follow-up episode was broadcast. Reporters gathered at the National Observatory for a monumental announcement. Against all odds, the footage was genuine. Expert analysis and inspection of the DV cassettes found no signs of tampering, forgery, or manipulation. Once the evidence was presented, 
critics began to shift their stance, arguing that while the footage did capture an unknown aircraft, it didn't necessarily mean that it was extraterrestrial. Yalchun Yalman and Haktan Akdawan were vindicated. Yet, despite all the analysis, investigations, and expert opinions, the mysterious Kumbergaz incident remained astonishingly unsolved. For years after the media frenzy over Yalçın Yalman and the Kumbergaz UFO incident, several Turkish news outlets and independent journalists sought him out for interviews. At one point, Yalman faced severe financial hardships and had to sell the camera he'd used to record the Kumbergaz UFO sightings, just to survive. Despite this setback, the latest interview with him from 2018 revealed that he still enjoys gazing up at the night skies in Turkey. Beyond the question of whether or not UFOs exist, the societal implications of these phenomena are undeniable. They have captivated humanity for centuries, creating a mix of intrigue, belief, and skepticism. Media outlets often chase sensational stories like UFO sightings to capitalize on this fascination. In doing so, they sometimes exaggerate details, which can distort public perception. The allure of extraterrestrials and UFOs is so strong for some that it supersedes traditional religious beliefs. This shift makes individuals more vulnerable to narratives promoted by influential media corporations and potentially manipulative government agencies. For these reasons, it's essential to approach the topic of UFOs with both curiosity and skepticism. My name is Inhuman Form, and I make videos on all sorts of strange topics. So if you enjoyed what you watched, subscribe to my channel and go check out some of my other videos because I'm sure you'll enjoy those as well. Anyway, I'll see you guys on the next one.